includes, again, I think we've got a mix of old and new users out there and try to re-remember old and make sure the new users have some ideas of what we're looking at. We're going to cover the life cycle of codes. I think that's something that, um, boy, I need to change that color, don't I? Let me choose a different color. There we go. Um, we're going to talk about the life cycle of codes, and that's something that um, I, I want to make sure to cover, and we'll close with, as promised, some of five Chuck's coding tips. So, a lot of ground to cover. Let's get rocking. Um, your student manager in any database basically has a couple of jobs: organize, store, and retrieve data. And again, what what codes do? Uh, they allow us by recording information helps us answer questions like, what courses to offer. Uh, where are our customers coming from? That is, by the way, source code, tracking code. Uh, what interests do our participants have if we're trying to figure out what programs to offer? And what are the demographics of our best customers? The goal of a good marketer is to find your best customers, know what they look like, and then get more of them so that you know if you've got left-handed blondes from the south side of town, then you're going to try to find whatever kind of groups that will give you those people because they seem to be good takers of your courses. So the general rule, a general rule, and, and I hate general rules because everybody tends to have things a bit different, but code as much as you need. However, if you don't have a reason for a code, don't code it. And again, I think the the, uh, there, there is a balance here, and the idea is that just because there is a field on a record to store something, if that field does not have data, does not have data that you use, report, analyze, and it's not required by some other third party, don't code it. Again, don't bother your customers with information at request if you're not going to store it, report it, or use it. Okay, general coding rules inside a database, or, and manager specifically, any field in the database is a code because it stores data that you're going to use at some point. Now, some of the data is, if you would, uh, information about the person, but an address, well, that's a code. A city, yeah, that's a code. A zip code, well, that's a code. Normally, when we think about codes, uh, we think about, well, drop-down fields or validated fields where you pick, I'm interested in art, I'm interested in music, I'm interested in uh, business, accounting, finance, et cetera. And that is, that is correct. But again, um, back to the original item number one, any data element on a system is a code. It can be used to report data. You can put it on a report, and you can use it to select data. Uh, for a report. Uh, definitions. Code definitions in the validated side, we're kind of back to talking validated codes. There's generally an unlimited number of definitions that you can create for any given code. Um, get my mouse working here. Um, again, uh, student uh, interest code, grouping codes, unlimited codes. Now that actually, I guess, let me get back to that. Unlimited code definitions for any one given code. So for a name occupation, you could have 10, you could have 100 different occupation codes for a person. But for a code field that's a single field, you can only have one occupation description. In interest codes and in course grouping codes, you can have unlimited different codes for an individual. And that, of course, to do with name tracking and course setup and tracking. Uh, the other element is inside manager, codes are universal. Uh, if you create a code in a dropdown for occupation type, everybody in the system uh, will be able to have the same codes. There is an asterisk here. We'll get back to that later. And then finally, most all codes now can be deactivated, which means they can be hidden from view of your staff who are entering codes. And we'll talk about that in the life cycle business. Um, again, Lori, so far so good. No questions. We, we hang it in. 
screen so mouse movement good? The gym sitting by the pool. So <laughs> All I right. think we're good. All right. Preferences. Uh, one of the things that you need to pay attention to, and was talking with a, a, a client this morning, a customer partner this morning, uh, they inherited the system and, and uh, they're kind of new to it. If you are new or if you haven't looked at preferences in a while, go in and take a look at that. And let me jump to the name record, wrong one. Uh, so that when you're in um, manager, go to your edit preferences box. Go through the preferences and make sure that, read through them, do you have fields that are turned off that you really want to use? Because again, the preferences area will determine behavior. It will determine what your users are going to see, your staff users particularly, uh, when they are entering data. And again, remember, uh, if a field is turned off, uh, no one, now again, you got to watch no one meaning the black and we need to get this other screen. Uh, if you allow your users to set their own preferences, they could actually turn on and off the fields that are in black. Uh, items that are blue are global. So when you set that as a system admin, everybody's going to behave the same. So this is again one just because, uh, let me get back, just because you can see email address if Susie Q down the road has hers turned off and no one's paying attention, she'll be looking at a name record and she'll be saying, shoot, on my name record, uh, there is no email field. And you're looking at it and you say, yeah, it is. Well, the problem is that you might have a preference on and she might have her preference off. So again, that, that is something to pay attention to. All right. Um, if you had the most important codes, and I, I think this is general, is to make sure that you have a subject code. Obviously, all codes are important. <clears throat> but for marketing tracking or analyzing a program success by program topics or areas of course delivery, the subject code on the course is probably one of the most important. And what that does for you is that it will then allow you to share that subject code and populate the name interest code area. Those are related. So when you enter that code on the course, everybody in the class who registers will get that interest code. So it's kind of like the course has a subject code home buying. When a person enrolls in that class, they will get an interest code home buying. And that allows you an easy way to then do marketing or do analysis of students based on interests for both classes they've taken and classes that you might have people who are inquiries that say, I'd like to learn about home buying. And you can add that interest code to them. Lori, this is sometimes a, a, a quizzical thing. So far, so good. You got any things to add? So far, everybody seems to be very happy. We, we're hanging in there. Good enough. Um, I'm going to actually get some audience participation. It is uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, our time here. Uh, raise your hand, uh, and I'm going to drop everybody's hand. Raise your hand if you use subject codes on the courses. Uh, raise them up high. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm hoping to see lots of hands. Lots of hands. I'm seeing hands. I'm seeing hands. Just Amber, raise where's once, your hand? If you raise them twice, Amber, they go where's your up hand? Down. Come on. Okay, I know there's some of those people that are coding those. So okay, well, I am hoping that you do because I really think that is going to be a big. That's a big important element for helping you manage your programs. Other coding relationships within the system, and maybe I'm a source code on the name and tracking code. Um, on the name record, we call it source code. And that references how did that name first get into your database. Now, obviously, once you get a person in, you hope that they come back again and again and take your courses and come visit you often. But the source code is really the first, it's kind of, what is it, uh, first life or first contact if you're a Star Trek fan and Jean-Luc was discovering new worlds, its first contact. Which starship was the first ship to visit this distant galaxy? Well, that's what we want to know about the source code. On that, that code is related to the registration record. 
And that's called, we call it tracking code. And that is supposed to be, and you use it to store what is the promotion, the marketing, the advertisement that brought in this money and this registration into your system. Now the codes are the same. So you use the same set of descriptors um, to add the code. You only have one source code per name, one tracking code for every registration. And the purpose of the source code, how the name got in, the tracking code, is how the participant heard about the course. And that really allows you to do the money. When you create a source code, you put in the money to how much it costs you to generate that promotion and the tracking code report, which we see down here in all its glory down at the bottom. The tracking code report will give you return on investment. So you have an ROI figure for every dollar spent, how many that you get back. And if you were doing mailings, it'll actually generate your percent return. Now, um, where is that? We're going to actually take a second and take a look at that. In the coding area, subject code, name, source code, there is a dollar value that you can assign, ACHE journal, it was done on a certain date. The cost of that promotion was 900 bucks. Well, what you can do then is when you run your report, it'll tell you that ACHA Journal, that you spent 900 bucks on the promotion, you earned 2,900 bucks. So your ROI was $3.3 for every dollar spent. That's not bad. You'll try to get a five to one, but again, that's not chopped liver. Now, I want you to raise your hand if you are doing some kind of tracking code reporting, if you're trying to capture how the person learned, out, learned about the registration. All right, tracking code, source code. We've got a couple in there. Boy, we don't have a lot of others. I'm sure hoping more of you are doing this. Um, again, this will help the person who manages your marketing budget make decisions about what promotions that you want to continue doing year after year. So anyway, that's one that I would say is probably one of the number two most important, unless your department has an unlimited budget. Now again, if you're blessed with that, don't worry about it. But if you're having to mine your pennies, you're having to generate dollars out of your programs, you ought to darn well be doing your tracking code tracking. Tracking code tracking. How's that, Lori? All right. Uh, so far, so good, Lori? Questions, so far, issues? So, so far, so good. Occupation code, organization code. Um, again, this is probably particularly useful and handy if you are focused on business, career, professional, vocational programs. But that it allows you to really find out you know, if you're asking what type of a job the person has, are they blue collar, white collar, green collar, uh, cook, bottle washer, Indian chief, whatever they are, if that would help you develop programs or generate reports for your marketing people or for your board of directors or your board of regents that want to know who you're serving. And then ditto with the type of organization. Again, the idea here is, um, your, uh, are you a manufacturing, are you retail, are you real estate, finance, uh, education, government? Uh, that gives you information about the type of people that are taking your classes. Um, interest codes, again, this we talked about interest codes, subject codes, make all you want. Uh, students can sign as many as they want. Um, now, this is an area we said earlier that everybody sees a code, that once you create a code, everybody sees it. One of the options we added in Manager is the ability to scope interest codes. And what you can do is when you are setting up an interest code, you can identify a category for that code. Um, and I'm going to jump to manager. So if we're into name interest codes, one of the things you can do is identify a category. 
A, B, C, and Matthew, we probably need to get some kind of descriptor out there. We're missing the descriptor. Adult programs, business and professional, computer. So we're going to give that a category of C for computer. Now, when I'm in the name record, if I'm looking up Havlicek, and this is 8.0, by the way, if you remember, and hit Add Interest Code, if there, are, if there is no scoping identified, uh, we see all the codes. There's a bunch of codes, all right? So if I, I want to do just computer programs, now the only codes that are displayed are the codes related to computer programs. Where could you use this? Number one, if you have a large office and you might be doing everything from soup to nuts as far as type of programs. You could have adult programs, enrichment programs, kids programs, computer related or IT high tech, general business and professional. So if you do that, if you assign a scoping to a program, business and industry programs, it allows you to kind of sub-select the codes within an area so that you're only looking at codes that would relate to a particular subgroup. The other place where you can do where this can be helpful again is if you have different departments using the same database. Um, S uh, Southern Methodist has two or three different units using the same copy of manager. Well, if the unit that is doing more of the kids and uh, youth enrichment programs, what they could do is in their preferences, we go to edit preferences, and I'm trying to remember where we put that here, org defaults, do, 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 and Matthew, I'm trying to think where we've got that if Matthew is not on here. Uh, but that you can, here it is, default interest code identifier under the name side, and we probably ought to put that on home. Uh, you can specify that I am mainly uh, I mainly do registrations for business and industry programs. So when I do that and I set my default interest code category, I'm going to close out of the screen, get into Havlicek again. When I go to add an interest code, and the scoping isn't scoping here, business and industry. There it is. It's not scoping. But it should give me then, Sharon, we ought to make a note of that for eight. <clears throat> it should give me only these codes right from the get-go because I have a scoping set to only show business and industry codes. All right. Lori, how are we doing? Did that little uh, sojourn generate any questions you want to deal with now? Nope. I think we're good. All right. So the interest code scoping option. Um, on the name record, lots of fields that you can model, remodel codes. Uh, badge name can be repurposed now. By the way, occupation and organization. If you're, um, if you're not doing professional programs and maybe you want to use that for kids programs where you want to indicate if the kid has a dietary issue or if the kid has some if there is a particular characteristic about that student you want to put on the front screen, you can choose to repurpose, relabel, reuse organization and occupation now. Um, all right. Uh, more user-definable fields, codable fields, additional information. I think we'll cover that in a little bit later. Miscellaneous code. Uh, again, these are all part of the front screen here, the demographics one, demographics two. And credentials, and again, I think that just, and again, there's lots of ways you can use credentials. We're going to have actually a webinar coming up in a couple of weeks, three weeks, I guess, on credentials. So we'll cover that more later. Membership codes, again, all part of the base system. If you have an OLLI program, if you have a senior learning program, if you wanted to have some kind of a membership program, uh, the, the Friend of Connie group. And if you join the Friend of Connie group, you can get discounts on your classes. You can do that now with the, with the membership tool. Um, and again, there's a, there's a webinar on that in, in the webinar archives. We're moving along pretty good. We might be able to let people go earlier. I get to my dirt pile earlier, Lori. Um, <laughs> on, the, on the course side, 
um, again, the coordinator, co-char, these are fields that can be uh, repurposed, modified, uh, change the value of. Uh, you actually can use the category field. The category field is one that you get to create your own categories for grouping or, or categorizing courses for reporting purposes or internal reporting here, uh, internal uh, whatever kind of reporting you want. Additional information, again, we've talked about that. Uh, on the registration screen, well, we've got additional info. Uh, we also have status, reg code, and letter grade. Those are right on the front screen that you can store a code in. These you can label and uh, use for whatever purpose you want now. <clears throat> Life cycle of codes. Well, before we get into the life cycle, anything on that, Laura, you want to hit now? It looks like we'll have plenty of time for questions. I, th I think we'll wait till the questions at this point. Okay. Life cycle of codes. And again, were that we ever as beautiful as a butterfly, but uh, we could get some analogies going here. We'll, we'll pass on that. Obviously, the number one thing that you're worried about are, uh, is your active codes. These are the codes that you are using every day that you're assigning to classes, to programs, to students, to registrations that you need to run your business, report to some other party, or help your boss get what they need to get the job done. The next issue is editing codes. Well, you might say, well, we started off with code X, but we need to change it. We need to relabel it to code XY or X sub B. Uh, and again, uh, the system allows you to edit codes however you want. Uh, we'll talk about that. Retired codes. Now, these might be codes that you used at one point. You have records that own that code. But you no longer offer those types of classes, or your business cycle, or your business mission has changed. You used to run kids' camps. Now you're out of the kids' camp business. So you could retire codes. And, and again, the quick note on that is that would be you're going to deactivate codes. <clears throat> and we'll talk about this in the next couple of slides. The other one is merging codes. And that is, again, that you've been all creative and you've created 32 codes. What is that, Lori, the Indian word for rain? There are you know, dozens of words for rain in, in several Indian languages. And of course, us white folks just say rain, or we complain about it. You know. So the idea that you want to combine all of these 32 codes because you're Anglo and you don't care about the 32 styles, you just want to simplify it. You just want it to be rain. And again, there are, there are ways to do that. And then finally, it is the last part of the process is the dead and gone. These are codes that you may have used before, and it's like no way in the heck are you ever going to use that code again. Or you may have created some codes, and um, the program, you know, your, your institution has absolutely said you will not be doing this again. Uh, so that you just need them to actually go away. All right, those trying to think, Lori, anything else you can think about on a life cycle that you'd want to reference? Well, I don't think so, not at the moment. I think we're good. All right, so adding codes. How do you add and create the codes in the first place? Well, number one, most of the areas, most of the code areas are on the module codes universal code editor. And that basically is, and I'll get back out of here, the little code button at the top of, the, of your panel, uh, the add edit codes on your quick launch bar, or you can go module codes, and that takes you to the universal code editor. The other one is adding codes on the fly. And what this is, you'll see, and now a note for some users, you must be a level four or greater in your preferences or in your user level in order to add codes on the fly. But adding, clicking the plus button, that is to the left of a code, will open the code editor for the specific code area that you clicked on. OK, editing changing codes. And we're going to go live on this because that's where it's probably most clear. So if I were to go to interest codes, name interest codes, where to go, interest codes. 
and we've got some codes. We have Cisco, we have computer, and maybe instead of saying computer, we want to say IT or um, high tech. We're going to call this high tech now. So if we say we want to make this now high tech, and we change the code, your student manager will warn you. If you continue, it will change your references to all past codes in your data files. Uh, so it makes you confirm this. And we do want to do that, so we're going to say yes. And so all of the old codes that were called computer for both the name area, subject code, and the interest area are now going to be called high tech. The thing about this is that when you land in the interest code editor, and I want to make sure for new people recognize this, we're navigating and we're landing on an interest code area, if I could get to it. And I say, well, I want to add a new code. So I just start typing in new code and not paying attention that if I don't click add, it says, wait a minute, I don't want to change the code. I want to add a new one. So you say, oh, no, no, don't do this. Say no. Make sure that you hit the add button if you're adding a new code. All right, so I want to make sure that we've got the add versus uh, edit kind of thing. Code cleanup um, and merging, there's a couple of ways to do that. Uh, the code cleanup option allows you to go into codes and either combine them, delete them, or make them active or inactive in a mass mode. And again, if you're uh, inheriting a system and you're trying to do a bunch of edits under tools, data cleanup, code areas, you pick the area you want to deal with, interest subject. So if we said, well, we want to take uh, computers and we want to take, uh, and I abandoned that code area, so it left computers the way it was, and I say Cisco. Well, Cisco training classes are really computer classes. So what I'm going to do is click on both of these, and you'll note at the top, whatever row that I clicked on first shows up in the code value description. So if I do computer and then Cisco, the last value is Cisco and Cisco training. If you hit replace now, it would combine and replace these two codes with the word Cisco. Now what you can do with this is actually give it a different name. High tech again, H-I-G-H-T-E-C-A. -H and we'll call the description high tech courses. And hit the replace button. If the status, and it shows you the active inactive status was true or not, you'd have an option to do that. Updated two codes. It's going to recess the system. And when I'm done and getting out of this, and Matthew, I'm not sure that is behaving. Data cleanup, code areas, get into interest subject. And it did not take. So for some reason, that is not behaving on the update unless I'm, oh, you know what I'm doing. I'm not hitting yeah, I done. Say, I think you're hitting change status instead of replace. Yeah, and that would be Cisco, high tech, and hit the delete button, or hit the done button, and um, it takes us out of that. So that is the, the code, code cleanup tool. In the, we're on with that, deactivating old codes. This is the area that in the life cycle when you're ready to retire a code, uh, you deactivate it. And again, um, back to the codes area. If you're in, if you're dealing with codes that no longer are in the process, craft, maybe you're no longer doing craft courses. Well, what this will do, making it inactive, still will keep the code around so that your old classes, if you somebody wants to know what they took 10 years ago, you could go back and report it. But that that will keep that code from showing up in the pick interest code when you go to add a new name and pick their interest code. 
So that's a way to eliminate old, unwanted, unused codes uh, from your list. Uh, now, if you have AceWeb, you'll note the do not display code on AceWeb. Uh, this is kind of a reverse logic. If you're adding new codes and you want it to do, if you if you want to hide it from the web, then you've got to make sure to click the do not display. And actually, we should probably Sharon have an automatic. If somebody deactivates the code, although I'm I don't know. If Lori, if deactivating a code also hides it from AceWeb, but that should certainly, if you don't have the code active on your back office, you shouldn't have it active on AceWeb. If it's not active, it won't activate on AceWeb. Right. So in other words, uh, but that you can have a code that's active for the back office staff. And this is the idea. Your frontline registration staff could add codes, but you could choose not to put it on AceWeb. Generally, for AceWeb, you want to have a fairly simple set of codes for users to pick from because you just confuse them otherwise. No offense to our customers out there. All right, so deactivating codes. Um, again, and when are times when you want to pay attention to codes? Again, changes in the organization. You've changed, uh, you've developed new lines of business, you've eliminated new lines of business. Uh, you might have new staff coming in that want to use some different lines, you, you've eliminated some new courses. Again, that basically all ties to a need to evaluate and reevaluate the codes. And you're really asking yourself, are the codes that I'm using, again, if the codes that I'm using in the system, if I'm on a name record, are the codes that I have here, are those ones that help me manage, organize, plan, serve my students and serve my people that feed me my check. If they're not doing that, then you ought to deactivate it, remove it, delete it. OK, uh, changes. Kind of in summary, in terms of the general code rules, create as many codes as you want, but only as many as you're going to use. Use enough characters to achieve clarity. And again, we've widened, we've lengthened a number of code fields, so don't get all chintzy on making them one digit long. It doesn't cost the database any more trouble, effort to use the full five or six or 10 characters. Um, for interest codes, and this is particularly handy, consider a minor, ma minor, minor, major minor coding system. Uh, interest code now is actually a full 10 characters long. So you can have four or five characters as a major area, education, and then add a addendum onto it or a supplement. So if you wanted all education people interested in education, whether an administrator or a teacher, you say course or interest code begins with EDUC. If you only want to pull the administrators, you'd say interest code begins with EDOC, EDUC, ADM. You'd enter the full eight digits on that particular value. And again, you can use that with any kind of line of business if you're doing multiple, multiple lines of business. Um, code reporting. Again, you've got the codes. How do you know what's out there? Well, we've got a pretty good set of code reports that will give you a listing of the codes from reporting codes area. Now, the other thing that you don't forget is that the statistical reports area, we have it for names, we have it for registered, and we have it for courses, will not only let you run a report of the codes assigned, but it lets you query by a date range or a year range so you can see if the codes are new or old. And it gives you this handy dandy thing of how many people actually have the code, how many registrations the code generated, <clears throat> and the dollar value of everybody with that particular code. And again, this is out of names or statistics, names, demographic report. Uh, quick views. And again, this is another one. On most any code in the code master code editor, if it ties to a names, courses, or registrations, you can go to the specific code, 
click on show name draw or show course draw, and it'll tell you how many names or courses own that code. And here's what I'm going to wake people up. How many of you have ever gone in and looked at the draw on a code? Raise your hand if you've done that in the last six weeks. All right, Joanne, bless your heart. By the way, it was great to see you. Uh, and Lori, you get your letter yet? I did, and I talked to Joanne about it. Okay, very good. Uh, not many people on that. Well, let's show you exactly what you do to get to there. So if I'm in the code area and I want to go to, I say, well, I'm not sure if I had, I'm in courses now. If I'm not sure there are any courses that have a department code of Aceware, what you can do is go to the code, click show courses on courses that offers a grouping. Yeah, we want to group. It. And it's, by golly, there are lots of courses. And so it'll tell you there were 59 sessions of 15 unique courses that used Aceware as the department name. So again, depending on the code area, if we go to something that ties with names, uh, let's go name, interest codes, Oop, interest code scoping, name, interest codes, language codes. I'll get to it one of these days. Bear with me. Interest codes. So if we say how many people are interested in Aceware or based on an interest code, show name draw, and there are 55 names. And again, this would also let you see the courses. So that is a very handy way, especially when you're getting into uh, editing or maintenance of names. It kind of gives you an idea how many people might have those. And again, with the name draw date added, you can look at these dates and you say, oh my gosh, 93, 95. And obviously what you're concerned about, is that a code that we're continuing to use on up to the present? And by golly, you betcha, you betcha. Uh, like Sarah would say, we are still using the Aceware code. All right, uh, quick views, uh, we've got that. Uh, coding tips, all right, we're at the downward sprint. So what are Chuck's favorite coding tips? Number one, again, through the preferences area, you can recode all of those items that are blue are data fields that if you're not needing to use them for the original purpose, you can relabel that field and store something else in it. Uh, number two, validating numeric fields. Just got off the phone talking about, well, gosh, I wish we had more data fields on the name record that we could store information in. Well, number fields, maybe you need to store data that isn't necessarily tied to a number greater than, less than. Well, by using the plus element, and actually you can go to the help guide and it'll tell you about that, you can actually make a numeric field have a number, it's got to store a number, one through whatever, but you can indicate that one is going to signify they own a Ford, two signifies a Chevy, and boy, a number three, you want to line that person up with your daughter, drives a Maserati. <clears throat> so that you can actually store, uh, you can validate it, and you can store information uh, about a person tied to a number and actually cross-reference it to some particular value you want to store. And of course, you already knew that you could do this with, uh, with character fields, uh, where it'll actually store the value, pet type, boa constrictor, cat, ew, dog, uh, whatever. So. Uh, stamp function. Uh, if you say, well, you know, I'd love to be able to stamp these people with data, but I've never done it before, or we've got years of history that we want to um, stamp a value to, and we don't have um, the data in there, there are functions available inside the help, inside the Aceware function set uh, that are called stamp functions. And I'm in the help guide. Let me show you how I got here. Uh, so from the student manager help guide, if you go to student manager topics, we go to report functions. There is a whole group of functions called stamp functions. And what you can do is by adding that function in a just after, 
you can stamp a code into every name that the report generates. <clears throat> so that allows you to use the report tool. And we'll real quickly run that, accounting deadbeat. I want to do an additional report. And I want to pick a particular course that I happen to know. I don't think I've got one. Uh, 14F ACE 101 here. ACEWARE, Mastering Student Manager. I happen to know that that particular course was one that everybody in this class was a cook. I don't know why. They're all cooks. And I forgot to add an occupation code of cook to their record. So what I did was add this stamp value and what it says. If you answer yes, all name records will have the value cooked stamped into the field. You want to do that? You betcha. Name swap finished. <clears throat> so now if I want to look up Havlicek, I'm pretty sure I'm in there. It wasn't Havlicek. Let's go find that course again. 14 F Ace. Mastering Student Manager, look at the registration, look at the name, and oh, it was Cook. I was looking in the wrong place. There it is, Tommy Thumb. We have his occupation code stamped as Cook. So again, that is a great tool if it's in the, in the after the fact, <clears throat> being able to stamp a value. Changing a date on an interest code. Um, when you add an interest code on a name record, it has a date stamp on it. Uh, if there's a reason that you said, well, I want to update a date, you can, you can use interest codes to measure expiration dates, a lot of different things. You say, I need to change that date. By right mouse clicking on the, on the field, you can actually edit the date and say, well, that should be today's date, which is 07-16 and save the date, uh, update the date on, a, um, on an interest code. And then finally, another quick view, and again, looking up names with interest codes with the ability to export or be able to do a quick, uh, quick report on is through the F5 key. <clears throat> and what this allows you to do with F5 is in the custom condition area, you can do interest codes by typing the file name, name code. You have to, if you're not sure how this is going to work, you got to ask your tech and they'll tell you is that you type in the name of the database and the little cheat sheet there tells you with the interest code uppercase in quotes and it'll generate a list of all of those names that have that particular interest code. And we scroll down the list and we see there were 55 of those. So again, that allows you to be able to actually, again, export it to Excel. You can order it by name, firm, address, date added if you're wanting to do some quick views related, again, to, to interest codes. Well, Lori, I think that gets us to our Q&A spot. We got 10 minutes. Uh, just quick note, again, reminder, credentials is in a couple of weeks. What do you got for questions? Well, not too many, so you must have done a good job. And <laughs> I am very proud of you for getting all through that material and that. Well, we, sort of we, we, we moved right along. Yes. Uh, first question, why would you deactivate and not delete? If there, and again, um, if you wanted to show historical data, you would keep them around and deactivate them. Now, one of the things you can, you can deactivate as often as you want. If you've got a set of codes going on and you're doing fall programs, you could actually deactivate codes for six months and turn them back on. And so the idea here is that <clears throat> I'm trying to think, I don't remember what it was we deactivated. I think was it youth, youth programs? Uh, but that the point is that when you do the drop down, this drop down list of codes should only have codes that you're using. Uh, and again, if you said, well, I used to do art classes, I no longer do them, you probably don't want to delete that subject code from your older classes. Uh, what you do is deactivate it so it doesn't show up in the list. So again, 
the, the, I, I'm not telling you you can't delete them. Uh, it's just that um, generally there's no harm in leaving them deactive, leaving them deactive, leaving them unactivated. Your point is that if, uh, no, we don't want to do that. Your point is that when you're in codes, I want to make sure this is working right because we've had some funkiness. Ace where, there's art. I'm going to deactivate art, look up a class again, click the drop down, and art is gone so that it's not showing up. But again, if you, you really say, oh, look, I know for, it. now again, if you don't have any records with that code, and again, I want to clarify, if you created a code and nobody cared, nobody ever used that code, absolutely, get rid of it. That's uh, but sad. If you, I'm sorry? That's just sad. Well, uh, yeah, nobody <laughs> loved it. Shoot it in the head, make it go away. I'm sorry. That, that, kill it, put it out of its misery. Okay. Okay. But there is a certain amount of personal style with that. I'd say if there are records historically with the code, I'd, I'd vote to deactivate rather than to delete. Okay. And how do you set up the scoping codes? Are they preset or can you customize them? You may customize them. I didn't get there, but in the code setup, if you'll note under names, interest codes, there is an interest code and then there's an interest code scoping interest code. So when you go to interest codes, A equals adult programs, B equals business and industry. So yeah, you can create the interest code scoping that matches your lines of business and how you might have your office organized. All right, and I have got to oil my chair. Laura, you've got to remind me. Boy, this thing is noisy. <laughs> I'll send you an email. Yeah, send me a note on that. I hope it hasn't bothered folks. Yeah, bring the WD-40 from the base. There's my there's my squeaky chair. All right. Okay. Uh, scoping codes, do they show up online? No. Uh, what shows up online, and that's a good point, what shows up online is whether or not you have the, the do not display. Uh, if you have this mark, do not display, they will not show up online. Um, and again, you're saying that if a code is not active, that will also hide it. Uh, it by default won't show up online. Yeah. So scoping, uh, yeah, there isn't, <clears throat> there isn't any way. I don't, I don't think, and I need to check with Laura, with Cheryl. I don't think we have any way to scope a, a name account record online to be able to have it grouped by a scope. We could explore that if that's something people want us to. So. Uh, there was one more in here. Oh, somebody noticed the coupon codes in the code ink list. Yep, yep, yep. <clears throat> um, you can set up coupon codes. And again, there's, there's a whole section on that in, uh, in setting up your fees where you can create coupon codes that would be uh, used in um, giving, allowing people to put in a code and get a discount on the, on the course. Um, that's actually you know, not something we're going to be able to cover in this Q&A. Uh, what I would recommend is that you go to uh, the help guide. Uh, go to, oh, I hit the wrong, yeah, go to the help guide, search coupon codes, and <clears throat> that how to set up coupon codes. In the online help, Type in coupon, and you'll be able to look at how you can use coupons uh, within Student Manager. All right. How are we doing? How are we doing? Unless somebody has something else, I think we are all done. We did good. That's that summertime speed yeah. here. Everybody, the weather's good. We want to get our work done and get out and enjoy that good summer weather. So, um, again, if you've got questions about codes, uh, give us a call. Um, look online on the help guide, and uh, <clears throat> I'll basically will send you off to happy coding. And if you love coding, tune in in a couple of weeks for credentials. This is uh, uh, lots of things we can do with that. So, Lori, again, great, great set of slides again, and uh, thank you for putting those together. No problem. Have a great day, everybody. Enjoy Take your care. Time, Chuck. Say what? <laughs> Enjoy your dirt. There you go. Bye-bye. <laughs>